quick introduction. Um, I'm Karthik Ramakrishnan. I'm with Element AI. Uh, we've been start, we started uh, just under a year ago, um, founded by one of the, uh, I would say, pioneers and almost godfathers of artificial intelligence uh, in this world. Uh, and today, we're going to take a look at quickly what is artificial intelligence uh, at a basic level, uh, what it can do, what it can't do, and where is it going, uh, and maybe how it's going to impact your lives and what you can do about it. Um, so, to get started, truck driving in 2007. I like to travel the country. That's one of the reasons drivers get into the industry. They want to see the country. It's a big, beautiful place. Anheuser-Busch is the largest brewer in the United States. We ship over 1.2 million truckloads each year. We are always looking for new innovations in technology. Auto's trucks are the next area of transportation innovation. The driver would still be involved with the pickup, loading the freight, making sure it's secure in the back of the vehicle. And then once you're on the interstate, one switch and it's driving itself down the road. Well, auto technology is all about making the road safer. It's like a train on, on software rails. And so when you will see a vehicle driving with nobody in it, you'll know that it's very unlikely to get an inclusion. I proclaimed to one of the technicians, I said, I don't think I could have done that better myself. Uh, that was an interesting moment. We knew we wanted an iconic American brand that was passionate about their products. Budweiser was a perfect partner. For me, I think the most important things that computers are going to do in the next 10 years is drive trucks and cars. So it's great to be uh, at the forefront of that. I don't know about you guys, but I find that pretty cool every time the driver just gets up and walks away from his seat and the truck starts driving itself. Um, for you guys, it may not seem like a big deal, but it is a profound deal that a truck or a vehicle can now drive by itself. And the technology that's powering a lot of those changes and these advancements is driven by something called artificial intelligence. So what is AI and what can it do? Um, Artificial intelligence aims to create machines with human-like capabilities. So just take a look at that truck. When it drove itself, it needs to do and compute a lot of the actions and thinking and, and um, response to its environment that a human would do. So looking at the road, looking at the conditions, looking at the cars around, around them, uh, m making navigation decisions as to the destination they're going into, what exits they need to take, um, how to respond to the changes in the envir environment, particularly if they're sudden, a car comes uh, right crashing through the highway, when do you stop? A lot of those things requires it to feel, see, hear, and react, and interact with its world. That is what we as humans do, and that is what we're getting machines to do. And that fundamentally is what artificial intelligence is all about. Artificial intelligence is not something new. It's been around and we've been working on it for, since the 50s. We've had a lot of great moments of advancements and we've had moments of despair. Essentially, it starts working and you're like, yes, we're gonna do computer vision and computers are gonna see the world, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, they realize, well, that's, that was, that's the technology just stopped there. Uh, there's many different approaches to artificial intelligence that have been used. Um, 
uh, from you know, knowledge-based uh, uh, kind of approaches to deep neural network-based approaches, which is the current uh, advancement that's really powering a lot of these changes. Um, and so one of the things to understand is that the big breakthrough, why is AI such a big deal? It's been around since the 50s. Why are we talking about it now? Something profound happened in 2012. Um, neural networks, or, or deep learning, was a part of this space that was very, um, it was not really considered a big deal. It was, no one really cared for it. Uh, all the other disciplines of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence um, didn't really care as much for what happened in deep learning. There were three professors, uh, Professor Jeffrey Hinton out of University of Toronto, Professor Joshua Bengio out of University of Montreal, and Jan LeCun, who was a student of uh, uh, Dr. Hinton, uh, Dr. Yang LeCun is with Facebook now and he's out of NYU. And these three were really pioneering this area even though no one cared about it. And in 2012, something happened. In 2012, there's this competition called the ImageNet competition where people take all their best and coolest models that they built and run it through classification of images. Right? There's, there's millions of images in, 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 that, in that database. They run it on a subset, and they have to get a certain accuracy in terms of prediction and classification or identification. Up until 2006, 2007, you got 75% you know, accuracy, and the movement was, was you know, incremental, like a percentage maybe for, a, for every year. In 2012, it went from 75% to 84.9%, a whole 10% improvement within a single year. And that was profound. And what really changed was deep learning or neural networks. We actually got neural networks to work. How it started working, combination of factors. Um, we started using a slightly better version, a different version of, of uh, nonlinearity uh, in, the, in the model itself. Uh, we got more powerful uh, CPU, so GPUs, so whatever runs in your Xbox, the graphic processing units, which can do far better and far faster computations than a normal PC. You know, if you have gaming consoles, you would know. Um, we started using those, and we had a lot more data. We had these images that we were working on. So really, when these three things came together, suddenly there was a breakthrough these things started performing really well. And since then, in the last five years alone, we've gone from 84.9% to 97% accuracy in understanding uh, or classifying images. N humans can only get to 95% accuracy. The machines are actually better at recognizing things now. That's pretty profound. So what's changing? Uh, we have bigger and better models in the last five years alone. We have more sophisticated data sets. To make machine learning and artificial intelligence work, those algorithms learn from examples. So you need a lot of data to make them understand what's going on about past experiences and then make predictions about the future when new data sets or new uh, situations arise. So you have more sophisticated data sets now available. Um, we have faster hardware and better software. So with cloud computing, Amazon, and you have TensorFlow and quantum computers as they come through, will we'll push this to the next level. And then research breakthroughs. So the, again, the funding that's going into fundamental research around artificial intelligence, which is still growing, it's only the last five years that we've seen these big breakthroughs come through. Just imagine where this can go. We're just getting started. So a lot of funding is going into research. We're still in research phase. And so that, all four of these factors are driving the advancements in AI. Now, how is artificial intelligence different from what used to be done before? Previously, people would take a model or an understanding of the world, a domain representation, take all that expert knowledge and build rules around it. So if you were building a kind of a translation service, right, from English to French or English to Japanese, you would take each and every sentence, oh, this is how a sentence is constructed, this is the grammar rules of English, and here's the grammar rules of Japanese or French, and this is how they compare, and you code each and every one of those things into this software. Tedious, doesn't scale very well, and it's taken years for us to get to any level of accuracy or sophistication around it. Deep learning, on the other hand, is completely different. You take data, you take the outputs you desire, 
So I would take an English sentence, translate it into French, take that French sentence, and feed it both into this algorithm, and it builds a model. So instead of building outputs, we're now building models. And these models have learnt by themselves the rules of that game. So if you gave enough examples that encompassed and captured all of the scenarios of that particular domain and example, you actually get a pretty good model. So again, for those who are interested, a little bit of theory. Neural nets are basically layers of neurons or uh, representations, some similar to our brain. So you have these layers of neurons um, with parameters that are set up. And as an image goes through, these different layers understand different aspects of, uh, of what that image is. So this is a computer vision type model. It's looking at the different uh, layers. So the first layer is like edges. So if you had to see what are eyes, through a lot of examples, they would know these are the edges that define eyes and the nose, the ears, and then put that together, it becomes a face. So the higher level uh, neural uh, uh, network, uh, the higher layers understand the complete face, and then the lower layers understand the different components. So all of that put together, suddenly you now have face recognition algorithm. Um, again, that breakthrough that we talked about, up until 2006, 2007, we were probably working with you know, six layers of and then it became 34 layers in 2012. That uh, the the algorithm that broke open, uh, that had that breakthrough. And now we've figured out how to work with thousands of layers. That's again very profound change. So if you can now work with thousands of layers that can understand minute aspects of, let's say, speech, vision, understanding, looking at the patterns in data, you're going to get very far. So how does this work? Kind of an example of how does a machine learn? Let's take a look at that. Fun, oh, but it could be dangerous. Holy in cow! Life. Whoa! Whoops! Wrong way! <laughs> so that's after 3,000 miles. That's actually not bad. 3,000 miles is not much. So that hopefully that gave you an example in real life what learning looks like, right? That car just learned to drive by itself over a six-month period or less than 3,000 miles of driving examples. Again, this would have taken us years to do, now a few months. Now imagine as you go into the next, uh, okay, next generation of things that are yet to come, what could it be? Right? The advancements that we're seeing now are breakthroughs, exponential. Um, what you see, the advancements that happen in a year are equivalent to the last five years of work that's gone into this space. Right? That's, that's what exponential looks like. It just keeps adding up, right? And so, or, or multiplying uh, in, in, in exponents. So you now have a lot of advancements that are yet to come, and you guys are the ones who have an ability and an opportunity to influence on what happens. So there's still many areas in AI which we need to work on. For example, identifying emotions in texts or images. Figure out, figuring out what to learn next. So here's a machine that we are teaching explicitly what to learn. We want you to do X, so therefore learn how to drive a car. Versus the machine gets up one day and says, well, in order to drive a car, I need to 
know something about road signs because I'm now driving in, in, in Chile. The signs are in Spanish. I need to have context. And it le- figures out, it needs to learn that and learns, searches for that information and learns by itself, just as we would do. Machines are not there yet. That's, that's going to be a fundamental shift. Uh, translating a library of text, uh, navigating in a new environment. So let's say we taught this car how to drive and we took that same model and put it into a boat and said, now get from here to China. Could it do that? We don't know. But that's another area of research called transfer learning. So can we have one model that can learn from a set of data in one environment and apply it with very little data in another? That's a huge area of research, and that's one thing that uh, Element AI works on. So when you're thinking about where is AI going, um, we're talking about this fundamental level, right? Research level. How do we make things work and better and better and better? There's another approach. And I heard a few people come up to me today and talk to me about it, which is use cases. I'm picking mushrooms using AI. I'm taking census data, and I want to use that to predict what, what the, you know, the student community needs. Emotion detection. Uh, so th- there's these use cases that you can look at to say, well, I have a problem right now, and can AI, can I leverage AI to solve that to whatever level of advancement it is, and maybe I'll, I'll keep abreast and it'll change it even further. But there's many areas in which there's, there's things that need to be done. Right, here's something that's happened, which is pretty cool. Um, it's taking the dominant aspect of that image, and the machine is actually telling you what's going on in that image. Think of this application. Could you now read out to folks who are perhaps legally blind, and now they can understand their environment because someone's, spe- someone's speaking to them automatically, constantly describing their environment. Profound, right? But it's still not there yet. Right, because you know, there thinks a giraffe is, is, a, is a bird, right? A woman standing there with a sign on her shirt calls it a clock. So we're not there yet. It's got limitations. But we can very quickly figure this out. Um, here's another one, visual question answering, right? What, what vegetable is on that plate? Right, it says, it's broccoli, broccoli, it's getting it right, and then there are times when it's not at the bottom. Right, it's accounting, um, understanding exactly where the, where, the, um, where the examples are that it's not learned from and therefore cannot do it. Here's another one, which is reasoning. Right, so Sam walks into the kitchen, picks up an apple, goes to the bedroom, and drops the apple. Where's the apple? You and I would say the bedroom, because we follow the logical flow of where things are going. Can a machine do that? Not entirely yet. So these are, again, limitations. So if you didn't have an example, and if you wanted the machine to think for itself, I think there's a lot of where, areas where we need to input a time. Why does it matter? Because in the next 10 years, when you guys go out into the workforce, the world's going to be very different from what it is today. Just think about if you have to exponentially draw all the changes that are going to come. Driverless trucks and cars. You don't need drivers. You don't need truck drivers. That job function is going to go away. Perhaps. But a significant portion of that might go away. Highly repetitive tasks are going to get automated. Right? So lawyers, sometimes even doctors, um, small surgical tasks, diagnoses in medicine. We're now able to detect cancer using AI better than doctors can from MRI scans. So those professions are going to go through a transformative shift in how they practice their profession. So if you're thinking of going becoming an engineer or a physician or um, take any task. We're now, there, there's a company that's working on building um, massage parlors with, with robots. So massage parlors go away. Haircuts go away, perhaps. There's so many things that can happen. So think about that profound shift and how are you preparing yourself and how are you going to be a part of that shift? That's the opportunity. So again, lots of changes. This 
change in AI is as big or bigger, that's the prediction, than any of the other transformative changes that we've had in the past, from, mechanic, from you know, going from mechanical production to mass production to automated, almost as big as the profound shift that electricity brought into our lives and society, that's where intelli intelligence and artificial intelligence, that's the level of impact it's going to have. And the productivity gain is almost twice what it was before. So it's going to have double the impact of those transformative shifts in humanity. So again, think of the impact that we will, it will have. So I will leave you with this thought, and maybe we have time for a couple of questions, maybe not. Um, you have an opportunity, lots of areas to push the boundaries of where AI is going, to get involved, to use AI in, in different ways, uh, to create new applications and solve problems, uh, to, to actually you know, think about other industries that you might be thinking about and how it's going to impact you and be prepared for that. Um, so I'll leave you with that thought, and hopefully uh, you guys had a great time today. So thank you, Naveed and uh, Nadeem, for, uh, and TKS. Uh, for letting Element AI come and spend a few minutes with you. Absolutely. We do have time for some questions. Um, does anybody have any? Yeah, right there. Abid, can you feel? Do you think that there will be a way to make like a robot that will be able to teach other robots how to learn new things? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I think there's robots that are going to teach humans how to do things. Uh, perhaps, um, as well. So uh, if, for a robot, if it's like, if I need to transfer my uh, software, essentially, it's like copy and paste, right? Could be pretty simple for a robot. Um, transfer learning is one of those areas. If you, like, if you break it down and said, well, if I taught a robot how to do massages, can I help it to uh, you know, do physiotherapy? Right? Yes, absolutely. Any other ones? Hi. So do you think with the use of um, artificial intelligence, it's maybe in the future, is it going to make us lazier if we have robots doing some of our work? If you think about it, maybe like certain professions like doctors, if we have robots doing certain surgeries for us, will that make certain like, do like doctors like less incompetent in doing certain things if later on we learn only to do the minimum while we have artificial intelligence doing most of the work? It's a good question. Um, uh, before, there were machines that actually made cloth, for example, right? automated weaving. Uh, we had weavers who were weaving cloth. right? It was physical work that they did. Uh, did that make us lazier? Did electricity, I don't have to go around illuminating stuff. It just works automatically, et cetera, et cetera. Did that make us lazier? We just found better and bigger things to do. To huge, use, where humans are very good at, right, which is non-repetitive, like thinking tasks. So that's essentially where we've gone. I think it's not the case. We fundamentally are not lazy species, lazy as a species. We want to do things. We need to keep busy. So I think we'll just find bigger and better things to do. Awesome. Kartek, last question for you. So Element AI raised $100 million, right? They're trying to completely uh, build this infrastructure around AI and companies, right, solving some really tough problems. So when you think about your and Element's next five-year, maybe 10-year vision, what are your top three priorities? Like, what are you focusing on most to try and develop this infrastructure? Um, I would say three things. Uh, one, uh, from the front end. So our, our view is, Every company in the world needs to be AI first. Um, we have a few companies that are already in that journey. So the Googles, Facebooks, Amazons of the world, uh, and Microsofts of the world are, are pushing that boundary for themselves. Uh, where does that leave the other enterprises who don't have that um, capability or understanding right now? So how do we educate them and bring them along for that journey and give them the vision of where they can go? Two uh, would be research. So. Again, to reiterate what I said earlier, um, 
AI is just in its infancy. We haven't even, we barely scratched the surface of where this technology and, and, and movement can go. Um, who knows, deep learning may not be the answer for everything. What is it after deep learning? How do we, not, how do we prevent the winters of AI that we had where you know, improvements just stopped? Uh, how do we prevent that next one? So we're spending a lot of time in research to keep that momentum going. And third is democratization of AI. Um, I think fundamentally as a vision for us is how do we empower each and every person and keep that research open and fundamentally allow every person to um, uh, individual on this planet, if they want to actually do something in artificial intelligence, learn it, uh, and not be constrained by IP or patent restrictions, how do we make that as open as possible, accessible as possible, so it becomes as good as electricity? Awesome. So now you guys have the answer. If you want to get into AI and you're thinking about Element as a potential career path, he just gave you <laughs> the inside information of what you'll need to work on to really add value to organizations like these. So thank you, Kartik. This was awesome. Thanks. What's interesting about AI and, and what's really important uh, about what Element is doing is that if you ask the CTO or CEO at some of the largest companies in, in Canada. So I think the top four largest companies in Canada are, are banks, for example. You know, if you ask them, you know, what can you do with AI in 10 years and how are you going to integrate this into your company? Or if you think about retail, or if you think about re uh, fast food, they actually don't have a vision, most of them. And most of them don't have that answer. And even if they do, they don't have that capability. So when Kartik says AI is in its infancy, it's, it's in its infancy in terms of both research and democratization, what he's talking about. Just a lot of people might be thinking about it, but it's still a buzzword to them. And so it's how can you, you guys, actually make that actionable, right? And when we talk about AI, it's a culmination of a bunch of things. You might have heard terms like machine learning, natural language processing, image recognition, so how can you get all of these things to a standard, use them together, where you're actually solving some really challenging problems? And if you're interested, I would encourage you to, to learn more and go deeper into this.